Thank you for inviting me to talk. And um, I'm delighted to be able to talk about patellofemoral pain, what's new. My name is Claire Robertson and I'm a consultant physiotherapist in patellofemoral pain and a researcher and lecturer on the topic as well. So it's a bit of a whistle stop tour this of emerging literature. So we're going to look at um, really what's clinically applicable. Um, that's something I'm very passionate about as a clinician myself. It can't just be interesting, it has to be useful too. And so therefore I picked out things around um, the biopsychosocial model that are emerging, some qualitative literature finally. Kinesophobia is an in area that's coming through uh, with some interesting findings. Uh, a little bit around adolescent PFP and medial um, lateral dynamic control. So, first ever qualitative paper on patellofemoral pain was as recent as 2018. And Ben Smith's work is an excellent paper that I just think it really is worth highlighting the findings around this. It reminds us of the impact of this problem. So, it might just seem as mechanical knee pain to us, but actually when you read this paper and think about it, it reminds us of really quite devastating effects it can have psychosocially for people who are suffering with it. So we need to remember that there can be quite a mismatch between our perception and our patient's perception around the problem. So let's just have a little look at some of the emerging themes that came up from his thematic analysis. So first one was the impact on self. And what was really interesting was how profound this was. You know, patients were talking about altering their career aspirations because of their patellofemoral pain. Talked about hobbies lost and um, the sense of loss around that. And therefore often interlinked with that, the loss of social interactions. So for example, if you're a runner and you run in a club, then suddenly not only can't you run, but you can't run with your friends and you don't have that part of your social life anymore. And then theme two, the uncertainty, the confusion and sense making. And I see and note this a lot with patients. Um, I think this is driven by the fact that it's insidious onset. And actually, if you look at the health beliefs literature, it, it, it's the same in other non-muscular skeletal areas of insidious onset, like headache, irritable bowel. People can't quite understand why it's happened. They have a desire to make sense of it. So I think it's really important that we help patients. And this fits with this work with Ben. So a desire to understand the pain and very much believing it's very much around structural damage, which of course it often isn't. And frustration, really inconclusive results from radiology. So MRI results, x-ray results that really the patient wants to see that definite answer and it's not really often given. So what else did Ben's work? Um, so uh, he's shown that the third emerging theme around exercise and activity belief. So the patients overall believe that sport had caused the damage, that's an interesting word as well, isn't it, in this situation, and that pain experienced from sport creates further damage. It's quite catastrophic and very structural. And then the fourth theme, behavioral coping strategies, fitting with the activity was the causation, therefore the belief that rest, analgesics, avoidance of pain and knee supports were the best strategies. Okay, so that's not really where our evidence base for our treatments lies at the moment, is there? So again, another mismatch. And so theme five, expectation of the future. They, the patients believe the pain would continue, that physiotherapy would not help as it was based around exercise. So this belief exercise is bad, rest is good. So physio falls in the exercise category. So therefore, physiotherapy is bad. Um, so what are our conclusion from this interesting and insightful work? Uh, we need to avoid catastrophic terminology like wear and tear. We need to frame the problem, I think, as pressure because the patients don't find the concept of pressure alarming. And move them away from a structural paradigm, basically. Avoid pain, 
um, for the exercises that you give out, fine, because you don't want to wind up pain inhibition. But be clear to clarify that this is because you don't want to enhance pain inhibition, not that you're worried about causing further damage. And early on, this is important for referrers as well, to set the expectation that the treatment will be exercise-based. So my work on Crepitus really fitted very much with this. So it really showed that um, patients um, had again a very structural catastrophic belief system and some of the quotes from my work which was semi-structured um, in-depth interviews with thematic analysis here is some of the quotes um, it means my knee is wearing away it means I have arthritis it's my body's way of telling me to slow down so it very much fitting with Ben Smith's work and actually some research has been since my work which has been quantitative in nature and this work has shown that there's no relationship between crepitus and self-reported function, physical activity level, worst pain level in the last month, or pain climbing stairs. And then Pazinatu's group actually then looked at um, patellofemoral OA, where you might well have thought that crepitus would be more tightly linked with some of these things, but it isn't. They also found that it's not associated with the higher odds of having a TKR, a total knee replacement, and it does not affect function and, patient, and quality of life in patients with knee OA. So what do we do? Well, I ask every patient, if they comment on crepitus, what do you think it means? And if they say, oh, I don't know, I don't think about it, that's fine. But if they say, well, it needs, means my knee's wearing away, or it means I've got arthritis, then I might want to be taking the time to actually correct that inaccurate belief. So I'm going to educate around the fact it's a normal phenomenon. It doesn't correlate with severity of pathology. And as you can read here, this quote from my colleague's work, when educating patients about crepitus, clinicians should clarify that the sounds they hear have no relationship with pain, function, or physical activity. And this is the most important bit perhaps for me. Patients should be educated that they do not need to reduce their level of physical activity or stop physiotherapy because of their crepitus. And in fact, I asked every patient on my research trial, what would you do if your physiotherapy exercise made your knee noisy? And every patient said, oh, I wouldn't do the exercise. So we need to know that. We need to educate that it's okay if your knee is noisy whilst you're doing this exercise. So perhaps fitting again with this psychological interpretation is kinesophobia, and we mustn't underestimate this. And Selhorst has recently published on this, looking at the fact that cognitive and physical treatment is more effective than physical treatment alone. And showing that recent papers have shown that um, in drop-down tests, if you're jumping down off a block, that your poor movement patterning is more likely to be related to a high score on a kinesophobia fear avoidance score, such as the Tampa score of kinesophobia, as opposed to strength and weakness. So that's interesting. So poor movement isn't necessarily being driven by weakness approximately. And fitting with this is love this paper by Selhorst that came out last year. It was such a straightforward paper based around a psychological model. An eight minute video was based, based with these um, dimensions, identity. So in other words, what is this problem? Okay, it's your patella resting on the front of your femur. We have a problem around pressure cause so this is because you're now doing more stairs or you're wearing heels for work or you've taken up more running looking at cause to causative factors intrinsic or extrinsic timeline helping the patient realize that unless they try and address some of these things it might just grumble on so it's worth investing in some time to treat this consequences how can it impact or how should it impact? How should they allow it to impact on their life? Should they carry on exercising or not, etc.? And in line with those last two things, controllability, can they impact on the outcome here? And of course, absolutely. And so the video was made around these principles uh, to adolescents with patellofemoral pain. And they had fantastic results. So they tested immediately after the eight minute video and again at two weeks, having had no other intervention. 
and they showed that significantly lower for all of the following pain catastrophizing fear avoidance kinesophobia reduction in the anterior knee pain score and vas before and two weeks from eight minutes now look we don't have to all go rushing out and making a video we can apply those principles to make sure the patients can make sense of the problem and know that they can make a difference and empower them to engage with their treatment. So moving away from psychological to very much physical now is another area of my research looking at the VMO. So the VMO literature has been inconclusive really around firing and strength and so what I decided to do with an anatomist is look at muscle architecture, which is not a new concept. The first paper on muscle architecture, so we're talking here about fiber angle, also known as penation angle, was in the 1950s. But no one has looked at it with respect to the VMO. And what we found was that the VMO fiber angle and the amount of VMO attaching onto the medial board of the patella is very varied across the normal population. And we found in some people is uh, relative to the femoral axis, it's a 40 degree angle, whereas other people it's up around 70 degrees. Some people only have a third of their medial border with VMO attachment. Other people, it's virtually the whole of their medial border. And we found that if you're sedentary, you're likely to have a small angle and a small insertion. And if you're very athletic, you're likely to have a big angle and a big insertion. So we then, well, can we manipulate this? So we found that the VMO fiber angle, yes, it increases with exercise. So that's great because we're basically providing the patella with a more medializing orientated VMO. We found that closed chain and open chain had similar results. And we found that once they'd had a change in the VMO, the two exercises done to light fatigue twice a week was sufficient to hold the change. And we found that closed chain with the use of a stim was more effective than um, closed chain alone. So how can we apply this quickly? Well, we need to look out for sudden onset of pain and or swelling, because those are the two things that really are likely to cause havoc with the VMO. Um, so we're going to look at things like very heavy falls onto the knee or surgery. Um, and also sometimes things that cause a slight effusion, like a non-painful meniscal injury, can be enough to cause the effusion to affect the VMO. And then these can obviously lead to obvious atrophy, particularly also of things like patella dislocation. And we get that hollow appearance that then means their VMO is very vertically orientated with a small insertion. So, but a lot, of course, a lot of patients find that these exercises just make them sore. So we need to be thinking about how we're going to manage that so that we can train into fatigue without uh, that pain, which is gonna just drive further pain inhibition. And perhaps a really useful graph to look at, is this one by Steinkamp, showing that in early ranges of flexion, if we look at the red line, in closed chain, the load is much kinder on the patella than in higher angles. So yes, you can do squats, but perhaps do an isometric hold with weight at 45 degrees rather than no weight and moving in and out down to 90 degrees. Or on the leg press, keep the, the range shallow. And you'll note for the uh, open chain, it's the reverse of so the highest ones, highest load on the patella is nearer terminal extension. So we need to be clever about what we're giving out, how we're doing it. So to conclude in this whistle stop tour, um, I've tried to give you a little insight into my world, some really interesting emerging literature now moving us away from a purist, structuralist, quantitative viewpoint to richer uh, understanding of patellofemoral pain and its impact. Um, but of course, uh, as always, we get as you get stuff coming through, it drives more questions, which is good. We should be continuing to question uh, and carry on, hopefully moving the field forwards. So if you can bear to think about more patellofemoral pain after my talk today, then there's lots of resources for both clinicians and for patients on my website, Claire Patella. Um, and if you are stuck on a patient and want to pick my brains, feel free to email me on the email there. 
Thanks very much for listening.